Hello, beautiful community. We are talking about questions some of you have asked me for a while, which is about what the British public think about Ukraine and how sustainable British public support is. And what we'll do is have a hopefully juicy conversation about what the British public thinks about Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine and what the trends are and generally what that says about UK politics, about pushing up to 15% of the beautiful community is UK based. So you're very, very welcome um, to this chat. I have been on and off in this country since moving here in 1994. It's 30 years in the UK for me this month even though for a few years I left for Australia and for Tonga. But I've been here for a very, very long time and London has been my home for many years. So we'll talk about all of that. And we also ran on the community tab of the chat channel an interesting poll that we're going to end this chat with about who members of the beautiful community who are in the UK are planning to vote for at the next general election. And I'm going to give you my prediction of what that poll was would be. And then we're going to look at the results themselves. So let's get going. Of course, you know that my entire education experience is, is in the UK and um, the overwhelming majority of my adult life really is in the UK. Um, so, you know, and I've lived in, in, in different parts of England. Um, I first came to Dacha Slough in Berkshire, which is close to the home of um, Ali G. Ali in the house. And I've lived in... Oxfordshire in Oxford for educational reasons, twice in Norwich for educational reasons. Um, so all of my studies, all of my research in politics, philosophy in this country has been in this country. Um, so I have a deep political connection with British um, uh, political life. So let's see how we go. Now, cartoonishly, cartoonishly, um, we in Britain are a bit more pure in our support for Ukraine than, let us say, Spain, France, Germany. But we are not as intense as the most intense Ukraine supporting countries in Europe. We're not as intense as the Scandinavian countries, we're not intense as the Baltics, but we have a slightly higher level of purity than the other major countries. We just go in for Ukraine with fewer qualifications. So that's the cartoonish picture. The trends are negative, but they are slow. So we are not very polarized about supporting Ukraine in the UK, but we are drifting toward more and more polarization. But as we'll find, out that drift is slow and it only at the moment affects a relatively small segment of the population we'll talk about right populism in the uk shortly and so that trend towards supporting ukraine less uh, is there but it's small obviously it's expressed in two ways there is what you would call deprioritization of the issue and there is then what you would call sort of positive opposition to the issue or being neutral or even partly sympathizing with the Russian side. All of that, all of that spectrum is growing, but slowly, really slowly. And at the moment, we have quite a high level of um, simplicity and purity in our support for Ukraine, but perhaps not as great an intensity. Now, I have trolled for the benefit of our chat, but I won't burden you with it. A lot of polling data. But when you have the language, which actually all of us do English, of a country, and you have a lot of experience, and you have some 
further skills to bring about, whether they be journalistic or uh, academic and analytical, um, you can go deeper than polls in many dimensions. And there is a, a nice line I want to quote to you from an essay by Isaiah Berlin on political judgment, which toward the end of it has this sentence. There is a story, I don't know how true, that when Prime Minister Lord Salisbury, Salisbury was Prime Minister um, three times at the end of the 19th century, non-consecutively. He's only beaten by William Ewart Gladstone, who was Prime Minister on four separate occasions. Prime Minister Lord Salisbury was one day asked on what principle he decided whether to go to war, and he replied that in order to decide whether or not to take an umbrella, he looked at the sky. I think that's an illustration of that space, that our conversation is in some ways nearly entirely dedicated to that space of not normative opinion, what should or shouldn't happen, not factuality, getting the facts right, but evaluating and interpreting, making interpretations that aren't reducible to facts, but nevertheless do come in forms that are better and worse. Right? You can have a better and a worse interpretation. Now, you're going to be a little bit dismayed by what I'm going to tell you. Um, you won't be surprised by it, probably if you come from the UK, but you may be dismayed if you are expecting Ukraine to be the number one political issue. So, um, if you ask me what are the biggest political issues in the UK, I'd answer you in two ways. One answer would be economy first, NHS, the National Health Service, which is in, a, in an eye-watering degree of collapse and disrepair. Um, and that's an extraordinary conversation in of itself and a tragic conversation because that institution is so central to recent British history. Mm, but one answer I'd give you would be it's economy first and NHS second. But if we broke the economy down into sub-issues, which a lot of pollsters do, which of course would be cost of living, growth, inflation. Then you'd find the NHS at the top, and then second, third, fourth, fifth would be whatever breakdowns you offer people of economic questions, questions about how the economy is doing. Now, a recent YouGov poll that sort of integrated all of these economic questions put the economy top, um, healthcare a close second, the NHS a close second, and a little bit further down as the number three issue, immigration and asylum. Um, the first two issues are at the moment issues on which the next party of government, the Labour Party, is overwhelmingly leading in the polls. The immigration and asylum issue is an issue on which the Conservative Party that is going to almost certainly lose power at the next election is leading on. But if you break the economy down into, into several components, component questions, then you're actually going to find immigration and asylum to be the fifth or the sixth issue. And it's going to be NHS, economy, 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 right? What tends to come next is the climate crisis, and housing. After that, we probably get crime, education. Crime can sometimes be higher than that. Relations with the EU and tackling woke. Um, and we'll talk about all the challenges and toxicity around that and the, the sort of toxicity of anti-woke right populism without, of course, denying the, that there may be problem, problems with woke too. After that, so we're quite a bit down. This is my interpretation, but it's in line with standard polling results too. Come public transports, transport improvement in the local area, Ukraine war, war in the Middle East and Gaza. So depending on how you frame 
the issues. Um, Ukraine and also Israel, Gaza and generally war in the Middle East are a fair bit down. They're going to be matched to an issue like public transport in significance for you know, an, an average UK voter. We do have right populism in the UK. At the moment, it is expressed most clearly in institutional form in the Reform Party. And the Reform Party doesn't have a formal policy on Ukraine. Its leader went to deliver supplies to Ukraine and filmed himself. But most members and most supporters are against supporting Ukraine and they feel that constitutes a kind of betrayal. But that's not because they in any concrete way support Russia. It's a Britain first opposition to supporting Ukraine pr primarily. And my intuitive sense is that that disposition in Britain today taps out at 10 to 20 percent of the population. A lot of polls would have it lower, but my sense is that this disposition taps out. And I'm going to give you some insights when I try to guess. Well, well I know what the poll results are, but I'll give you my honest guesses about what our poll results, poll results of the beautiful community, what, what I felt they were going to be. And in discussing that, we'll talk about how there is a danger in overestimating the pervasiveness of certain positions, and in particular the right populist position, um, online. You can often confuse yourself and think, well, this is like 90% of the people, but it's actually 20%. It's especially analytically useful to pick out the populist right in the UK, because it's not just that they have different view on key issues, but it's that they are at odds with the majority of the country at the moment in what they perceive to be key issues. Um, that's to say they don't go on as though it's the economy and the NHS that is central. They go on as though central are immigration, Islamist extremism and um, woke. They um, are animated by anti-woke. Now I've given you some reasons recently to be animated by woke and be concerned about it, but I'm against being animated by anti-woke. We do not want an, an anti-woke brigade activation um, that certainly in the forms that's being expressed now has poor form ethically, analytically, and, and, and politically, and many of its advocates on this platform, quite frankly, advocate for a disgraceful anti-democratic politics. And as um, uh, a, a lovely, lovely UK conservative, Rory Stewart has said um, not long ago about these people, how dare you, how dare you, present yourself as questioning the establishment, just having a conversation, just asking questions, and then you recommend positively destructive and toxic political candidates. Rory says, how dare you? And I agree. And that's a very powerful question to be presented to a lot of content makers on this platform who just ask questions, who just ask questions. But then they end up recommending destructive political candidates. There is a lot of just asking questions. So, this 10 to 20% that I've described will grow, but it is confined at the moment. And it is interestingly contrastable with the rest of the country in the issues they take to be a priority. One of the challenges the UK faces is that the Conservative Party has plenty of motivations to try to move 
into that ground after its election defeat. So at the moment we've got a Conservative Party that is not soft right, it is medium right at least. Um, and and it, it, it will have plenty of motivations to move to the harder right in order to try to gain some friction um, over this small but slowly growing demographic where they can easily get an advantage over Labour. So at the moment, the, the Conservative Party is far behind Labour on the two biggest issues, health and the economy. And if you break down the economy into several issues, you would then say that Conservatives are behind Labour on the top three or four issues. Now, we can put down as just a little carpet at this point the generic 4 plus 4 formulation, um, which is just a note about the modes of democratic degeneration we're experiencing. So we've got forms of you know, pulling apart, forms of economic and political atomization, breakdown of community bonds, breakdown of social fabrics. We have got this, right, the state of the internet, as a deforming influence on our politics and the crisis of trust in our politics. We have got various um, radically polarizing ideologies of self-realization really that add all kinds of moral primacy to political opinion in a way that what is historically atypical that tie up identity with political opinion in a way that is historically atypical and that insists that institutions mirror that in a way that is historically atypical so we've got these kinds of um, ideologies then we've just got an enormous amount of exclusion and these four trends pair up with four modes of distrust of political institutions. The, the most benign one is just feeling unsafe because your institutions are incompetent. The second one is feeling betrayed by your institutions. They're working against you. And this is this prominent feeling a lot of people are getting on both sides that their political opponents aren't opponents but enemies and as enemies they're evil. The third deformation is really this feeling of powerlessness. There's nothing I can do to inflect the political process. It's completely and utterly out of my hands. I can't touch politics. But the worst of all is the fourth one, which is opacity. It's the feeling you cannot see your political institutions. And that is why we've got this extraordinary tension between truth and agency in politics. There's a lot of people, for example, um, Trump voters, some reform voters in the UK, who feel that when people like you and I tell them, come on, stop doing post-truth, um, they, they, they feel that that terrifically represses their political identity because what are we telling them? We're telling them to admit the truth about political institutions which they find opaque, which they cannot see. We're telling Trump voters, look, admit the truth about your political institutions but they can't see them. You are forcing something uh, that is very, very difficult, impossible to give until they begin to see them. So you've got to make them see them first. So how do you give Trump voters a sense of political agency is a primary question, not how you re-educate them, for goodness sake. So that's a little carpet of, of, of s s s some of the landscape that we're, we're occupying and that carpet will get worse. Now let's move more specifically to support for Ukraine and to Israel, Gaza, Israel, Hamas, Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a contrast perhaps. I mean the shorthand is that Brits, let's, let's just start with Israel, Palestine, Gaza, Hamas, because it, it, it's a much less pure situation in terms of 
British attitudes. But very roughly, and I'm going to give you a few poll stats in a second, but very roughly, the Brits sympathize with Israel much, much more than they do with Hamas, but they sympathize with the Palestinian people much more than they do with Israel. This is a recent YouGov poll going into mid-late March 24, 2024. Which side in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict do you sympathize with more? The Israeli side, 15%. This is population total. The Palestinian side, 29%. Both sides equally, 25%, don't know, 31%. So, um, we are talking about probably double level of sympathy according to this very particular. So, give this a very low degree of weight. This is just one poll statistics I'm, statistic I'm sharing with us. Um, so, it's, so, here it, it's sort of double sympathy for the Palestinian side versus sympathy for the Israeli side. Of course, at this point, you need more polling data than it's here, but I won't read it out about intensity of sympathy and so on. And you can break this down demographically, regionally and so on. What's your attitude to Hamas? Very favorable, 1%. Somewhat favorable, 3%, so total favorable, about 4%. Somewhat unfavorable, 14%, very unfavorable, 56%. So in total of unfavorables is 70%, and don't know is 26% or so. So that gives us an indication. Do you think the Hamas attack was justified? 5% yes, 67% no, and then... 27 don't know. Is Israel's response, uh, Israel's attack on Gaza from October onwards justified or non-justified? 24% justified, 46% unjustified, 30% don't know. So you're basically getting the picture. Um, we're talking about infin not infinitesimal, but close to infinitesimal support for Hamas. Um, but if you abstract away Hamas and you just say, where's your sympathy go? There's a lot of sympathy for Israel. There's a lot of sympathy for the Palestinian people. The sympathy for the Palestinian people is bigger by about double. And now contrast that with a much greater purity on Ukraine. Which side in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, this is YouGov again, March 2024, which side in the Russia-Ukraine conflict do you sympathize with more? The Russian side, 2%. Ukrainian side, 82%. Both sides equally, 4%. 12% don't know. How favorable or unfavorable is your view of the Russian government? 1% very favorable, 2% somewhat favorable, 7% somewhat unfavorable, 79% very unfavorable, 10% don't know. So you're getting the um, dichotomization here. Do you think the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022 February was justified or unjustified. 3% justified, 87% unjustified, the rest don't know. So, what we are getting is a quite a high degree of dichotomization here. Um, my observations are that 
we are a bit more population wise pro Ukraine than Italy, Germany, Spain. When you look at other polling data about how much you want Russia driven out versus a negotiation, we, we tend to tilt more toward driving Russia out. And some of the recent polls suggest that 50% of people answer drive the Russians out, 25% answer uh, negotiation. But that is perhaps in contradiction with some other answers that are given. For instance, only 24% support increasing support um, for Ukraine, 44% su um, support sustaining support on also recent, some of the recent polls that I've seen. And we tend to care with a little bit more intensity than perhaps France or Germany about who wins. Um, so when you give answers like, I greatly care who wins or I care somewhat who wins. In, in the UK, the I greatly care tends to be just a tiny bit higher than um, I somewhat care. But again, you have to understand the context that we're talking about issues that are um, of sort of sixth, seventh or even eighth, ninth order in terms of political priority. And then my own clear observation, that's also, I think, reflected in, in the polls, but I'll just state it flatly. Of the people who care about Ukraine, Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine as an issue, and of the people who, ca who care about Israel, Gaza, Middle East, the intensity of feeling about Israel, Gaza, Middle East, whatever view you take, is greater than the intensity of feeling about Russia, Ukraine. Now, let's talk about the beautiful community because we ran a poll. And I asked UK voters who will you support? And I wanted to say support rather than who will you vote for? Because a lot of people will be in um, safe seats, uh, which will mean that they get to vote for whatever they want because um, their local MP is just bound to uh, uh, you know, retain power. Other people are in edgy seats and that means they might give their vote to somebody who they don't support as much as some other party they would have voted for um, if the race in you know in their seat wasn't as close so that's why i wanted to slightly tilt it away i'm not sure how much people registered this to what could you support rather than who you're going to vote for but my poll is ambiguous about whether it's about support or voting now i can tell you what my prediction was we have as I say, about 15% of UK-based folks in, in the beautiful community. On the main channel recently, we have been tapping out a repeat audience of just under 200,000. That's to say, under 200,000 individuals watch something in a given month and within the same month, several days later, come back and watch something else. So that is about under 200 on the main channel and, and, and over 100,000 on the um, chat channel. So we are talking um, about you know, up, up to 30,000 Brits as repeat viewers in a given month. So that is a very big village, but it's too small to be an infinitesimally tiny town. And of course, we tilt not just pro-Ukraine, but we tilt center and we tilt center left and we tilt climate more. So here was my prediction. My prediction was that about half of you were going to say that you were going to vote Labour.
because that is um, partly just a reflection of where UK politics is at, the Conservative Party is doing really badly uh, in the polls. But it's also a reflection of the fact that we lean a little bit more left and a little bit more pro-climate, or at least a little bit more centre. I thought that the second party, far behind, because it would be 50% for Labour, I thought, and 50% would be broken down between the other parties. I thought by a big distance, but still second, would be the Green Party, because we, we do lean to taking the climate crisis seriously here. In the most engaged, among the most engaged viewers, a lot. Among the wider community, when you tap out and you go for these sort of 30,000 Brits, then less so. Um, but even among those, I thought the Greens would just make it into second place. Third, I expected reform. That might sound really strange. But third, I expected reform because of the special polarization of the internet. That even on platforms uh, and in spaces that seemingly um, you know, cater to a different audience, even though I try to cater to anybody who is willing to come along and think along. But you know, it, even in spaces like, like this that, that often criticize right populism for being anti-democratic, you, you're going to get a, 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 a certain percentage of, of viewers of that kind. And that is a reflection of the polarization of the um, internet. Because, of course, in reality, um, the Conservative Party would, you know, would be expected to get many more votes than reform at the next general election. But still, somehow, I felt reform would be third for us. Um, be be because, in many ways, moderate and soft conservatism is rather edged out on the internet, you know. Um, much more than it is in real life. And it's very important not to take that as a reflection of real life, actually. Um, and one of the fairly recent sort of stark experiences of this was when I um, was very grateful to participate in this um, um, public uh, television program, multi-country Scandinavian public television uh, investigation of Russian disinformation, also of Nord Stream. Um, I, I bumped into a few occasions where different broadcasters shared clips of me on social media platforms. And I just out of curiosity checked the, the comments. And on one or two occasions, I was reading dozens upon dozens of consecutive comments with nothing positive interrupting them, saying CIA asset, disgraceful CIA asset, disgraceful CIA asset. And you read that. And you think, gosh, this must be the majority because it's just coming and coming and coming and coming. But actually it's not. It represents a minority opinion still. So it's very important to get that rather right, to get that clarity. Um, especially for institutions, actually, because what I often see is journalistic institutions facing this flood and then thinking, oh my God, we have to play defense now because we're assailed on all sides. But actually you're not as, as assailed as you think you are. And then I thought... Fourth would be Conservatives or Lib Dems, and fifth would be Lib Dems. So these are the five options I gave. So how did I do? Number one, uh, this is five or six hours in, so this will still keep going, is Labour at 51% of the vote. So 51% of you who answered, it's only 1.2 thousand so far. It's been up for a few hours. These are Brits. I hope you're Brits answering. I think most people are most people are fair and they, they don't answer if they're not from the UK. Um, so 51% Labour. I didn't quite get there with the Greens. Join second on 14% are the Lib Dems and the Greens. But interestingly, the Greens were at 20% for the first couple of hours. And that's because the people most closely immersed in the community are going to go more that way. So the Greens have dropped and they're not second. They are, well, they're joined second with the Lib Dems who, who are on 14%. Um, and then fourth and fifth 
on 10% are Tories in reform. So I was wrong about reform because I expected reform to be third. Um, but I'm not surprised that Tories are joint bottom. So there we go. We've got 51% Labour. Number two, let's put Greens number two. 14% Greens. Number three, 14% Lib Dems. Number four, let's put Reform last. Sorry, Reform viewers. As I'm sure some of you are, are decent, lovely folks engaged with me. And I'm going to put you last today. Tories are fourth. Reform on 10% and Reform is last on 10%. So there we go. If you generally think about British politics, the prognosis, the default pessimistic prognosis, which is what we still have some power to avoid, is this. The Tory party is in crisis at the moment. The Labour Party will come to power, then enter perhaps its deepest crisis ever. Both Tories and the Labour Party will be in deep crisis. Electoral reform will be on the agenda. It may occur. It won't avert the problem. Anti-democratic populists will be hovering near power, middle of the 20, 2030s. Our institutions are strong in the UK, like in the United States. They're disproportionately strong. They're stronger than in many European countries. So it's harder, going to be harder to break UK democracy. But this is the negative scenario we have got to avoid. And there is nothing deterministic about what I've said. It is just the default direction if we don't do an outstanding job. So, But as far as U Ukraine support goes, we are in a relatively stable place where the, 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 the major institutional force in UK politics that is positively anti-support for Ukraine is a right populist party that has a demo that taps out at 20%, but probably lower. Having said this, if you look at the statements of the UK Labour Party about their Ukraine policy, they are vague. They are really along the lines of, yeah, we're going to be standing by Ukraine. How? how? What are you going to do? What are the outcomes you're after? That is, that is at the moment too vague. Enough, enough, enough. Lots of love. Thank you for being with me. Bye-bye.